BOTG with back. Hashtag boots on the ground with back for what's mine. 100. Yes, gentlemen and gentlewomen, how are you all? Back with back. Right now we're in the historic Midway First Presbyterian Church and Cemetery. And like I say, we are Midway, Georgia. Now the reason we are here is for this beautiful, highly intelligent woman right here. We do a civil war and 40 acres from the Savannah, Georgia point of view, she's very instrumental. Miss Susie King Taylor. Actually, her maiden name is Baker. We're gonna read up on it. So we doing boots on the ground. I got my cool kid with me. We doing it together. So it's an educator, nurse, and author. Suzanne Susie King ba Baker King Taylor was born into slavery. Ditchy family on the Great Plantation in Liberty County, Georgia. Educated as a child at secret schools in Savannah, she escaped slavery in 1862 during the Civil War. Now we know in 1862 also, that's when uh, Abraham Lincoln brought out the Emancipation Proclamation. So she escaped before that. She came to her grandmother home in Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, and that's when how she escaped the slavery, uh, they say. Okay, in 1862 during the Civil War. In 1863, she married Sergeant Edward King of the first all black US Army Regiment. The first South Carolinian volunteers, 33rd U.S. Colored Troops. Moving with his regiment, she served as a nurse, laundress, and teacher. After the war, she opened schools for African Americans. Let it go with that social construct, you know, in Savannah, in Savannah and Midway. In 1874, King moved to Boston, returning to Midway in 1879 to marry Russell Taylor at the Medway Chapel and school located here in Liberty County, where we at now, Liberty County, y'all can Google that. In 1902, she published her memoir, Renaissance of My Life, and capped with the 33rd U.S. Colored Troops. Susan King Teller is buried in Massachusetts. You know, in Boston, she's in B-Town. And another thing we learned about Miss, Miss uh, Baker, King Teller, is the, um, According to her memoirs, you know, her great-great-grandmother was an indigenous Indian woman out of Virginia. So we know we had different tribes in Virginia, but you know one heavy tribe was the Powhatan. The Powhatan, yes, Pocahontas uh, uh, family. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a correlation, but I just found out a fun fact. And uh, we're going to go to her museum, Cool Kid and I, and uh, we're going to get some more work on this. Let's go and get it. Civil War. Back for what's mine, B-O-T-G, 100, 100. Hashtag, hashtag B-O-T-G with back. As promised, when we looked at Miss Sarah Baker King Teller on part one, I said that we going, I had something special for, for part two of her. Right now we in Hinesville, Georgia. You know, uh, you can see that this is a Confederate statue. I just wanted to bring it since we're still talking about the Civil War and 40 Acres and a Mule. And you can see it's 1861 and 1865. The war between the states. Right? It doesn't say who this gentleman is, but but most what we came here for, what we came here for, I will go if this is anybody family, I should reach out so you can see. It says, Liberty Independent Troops G, 5th Georgia Cavalry, Liberty Guards Troops of 5th Georgia Cavalry, Mounted Rangers, Jeff Davison Legion. All right, but let's go over here. This dude, this is where we came. This is why we do boots on the ground. Hashtag, 
you went back for what's mine. Now, we over here. This is important, important. See who we got in the window. Who is that? Hey, Blake, and that's you. What you doing? What you doing here, spy? Who else over here? Is that Harriet Tubman? Hey, in the window. This is where we at, family. You know, we put the ties to the pavement. We'll get the tangibles to the game, get the out council. Now, while we here back, I want to show y'all something. We're here for this beautiful woman. See that? I know the glare is there. There she is. That's Miss Susan Baker King Teller. Started educating kids at 14, and we found her museum that dedicated just to her and her life. Her untold story. I told you we're doing un untold heroes of the Civil War. And we know that she escaped to Fort Pulaski that we saw in part one. So we had to bring you her story, right? She was educating so-called slaves and so-called and uh, people from the regiments, the colored unit, the 33rd. So we're gonna go inside now. We're gonna go inside now and uh, let's see what we got to go. All right, got my help a cool kid. Let's see what we got. Wow. That's a big turn, right? See here? That's, that's a lot of work. You can look at how heavy that is. There she go. Miss Susie Baker can't tell her. An astonishing woman. Stories never told, you know? And like I said, here's her memoirs that we talked about earlier. Actual here. This is another memoir, her, her life in the camp. And she talks about when she was uh, helping the soldiers and she learned to shoot, hunt, and uh, healing people and teaching people at a very, very young age. And that's King Cotton. Like I say, for me, your reasons for the Civil War, because we know, like I say, when Lincoln signed in the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862, you know, he had plans to send uh, so-called free people to other places. And uh, we had the facts on that. You got Haiti, Sierra Leone, even Canada, he was trying to make deals uh, for that. Um, even South America, it was anywhere but America. So, you know, and even before that, we had, uh, I think it's Colonel Hunter, um, that had his proclamation down at Fort Pulaski. It was proclamation seven and number 11. And uh, Lincoln took that out. Um, so when we really look at it and we dig through it, we're gonna dig on Miss Susan King Teller, main name Baker. Like I said, she, um, her mother, uh, grandmother is from Savannah and she's from Liberty County, where we are now. Um, and she came to Savannah to escape what they say so-called slavery. They say she was born in slavery. And come to find out in her memoirs, if I'm not mistaken, and we read it right, that uh, her great-great-grandmother was Indian was an Indian woman uh, out of Virginia. And like I said before, you know, that's over there in um, Powhatan. I don't know if that's her nation, but we could double check on it. There's some history on her. And to be a, a child at that age, to have that type of weight on you, and she carried it so elo eloquently, her story is not told too much. And, uh, you know, BT, BOTG, we're back. I'm gonna make sure we get out the unsung heroes and really get the truth best as we can get it out. Right now, I say we're in the museum. We put tangibles to the game, you know, and try to fill in the blanks the best way we can um, to find stories. This right here is images out of the museum. Uh, yeah, your Confederate troops of people of color, so-called, and they were fighting with the Union and also fighting with the South, the Confederacy. Here comes some of the authentic that the soldiers would carry with them to eat with, you know? So we put intangibles to the game. Some of these pictures right here are some of your colored soldiers. I don't like to use social constructs, but you know, I wish I knew exactly where these people were from and name, I will honor them. And we see this picture a lot all over the internet, right? 
Just digging on the history. Hashtag BOTG with back. Or Sarah Barton. This is amazing. That's a uniform. We got the colored troops. Intense. And it's a shame that his story, they, they hide a lot of this. You know, we still fighting that, trying to get the truth out. And it's just, the truth is the truth. You can suppress it, but you can't hide it. And when it comes, just, just let it be what it is, you know. It took a lot of people. They say over six million people died in this war. So that means it was more that was in the war. So we can't just tell a story about two or 20 people. There's a lot more stories that need to be uncovered. So that's what we do. And we drive to go get the tangible, right? We're gonna check out this book here. It's the African-American Faces of the Civil War. And you know, we still do the genealogy. It's an army life in a black regiment. Susan Baker King Teller Museum we are in. And uh, some more interesting things that I'm learning. That's why I like to do the boots on the ground and travel. This image you see right here is the South Carolina. I understand the image, uh, probably 1863, you know, around the time of Lincoln's uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Actual image, uh, actual factual tangibles is what we like to do. I'm gonna go a little slow. You might see some of your family. Like I say, genealogy, never know, never know. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be careful, you know. Uh, this uniform here, this is what I understand Miss Sarah, Bar Miss Sarah King Teller would have been, Susie King Teller would have been wearing uh, the, the outfit. And the gentleman here, they're telling me this is the union's first uniform that they would have had. And you can see, this is a, definitely a up north uniform because it's wool and it's hot, hot in the south. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as I'm understanding, the red pants, the soldiers did not want because you could be easily spotted and that's a target on your back. So, you know, down south, you know, it gets 90, 110. So, you know, they probably been, had their t-shirts tied around their head like we do today, nothing new under the sun. But this is a replica of what that would look like. This image over here. It's Georgia, right? So this after Emancipation Proclamation, I'm assuming. He's been, uh, he's been working. Y'all make sure y'all come to Hyattsville and check out this uh, museum. Now uh, this guy, I don't know if y'all get his face. A planter. He had this book here. Try to get a good picture. It said religious instructions of the Negroes of the United States by Charles C. Jones. Mm -hmm. Charles C. Jones, ladies and gentlemen. A and as I understand his story, he had over 200 uh, slaves, so-called. And what he would try to tell them is slavery is, you know, the whole slavery is good. My slaves are good. They don't need nothing. And he was concerned about their souls, but never freed a soul, as I, as I, as I, I was told the story goes. So we'll do some more research on him. I want to keep this about Miss King Teller. And that's the New York Observer, if you're looking for that. And this is the church that he controlled, owned, So again, the museum, a wonderful place. Make sure, I believe the address, you know, we're gonna plug the address and make sure you come and visit and support to keep it going. We need to get these unsung his heroes. They need to get theirs. And so again, Susie Baker, King Teller. Thank you, man, for your service. Still shouting out Susie Baker King Teller. You know, we just left a museum and um, I had to bring you to her school. This is actually, we're back in Savannah, Georgia. Susie King Teller Community School. This is the school.
for that beautiful woman that did so much for so many people at a young age. So yeah, hashtag BOTG with back. Put the tangibles. Thank you again, Miss Susie King Teller. Baker. Made it to the fort, Fort McAllister. Y'all know we going in the walk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hashtag BOTG with back. Let's go in and see why this was important. Now this fort is on the south side of Savannah and it was very important to, in the Civil War, to protecting Savannah. Let's go see what happened. Yo, 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 <laughs> we in here. You know, I got to pay the admission, you know how it go. But it's cool, it's cool. We at Fort McAllister. Like I said, a uh, strategic spot that the Union had to take for them to get to Savannah. They had to come and take over this fort. Now this is only a Geechee River. Now right now, y'all know, like I say, take your shoes off, these grounds are holy. Why you say that back? Because this is Wale Indian territory. Right, right, right. Shout out to the indigenous, right? So we in Wale Indian territory. Some say Gullah, right? So let's break this down. Let me show you something. So if this Wale, some say Gullah and let me show you this here. Take you over here. Let's look at it. Wale, Gullah, and I'm gonna get you on the other side so we get closer. Guess what river this is? Huh? This is the Ogeechee River. So when we look at where they say Gullah Geechee, some say the Geechee comes from this river. And they call these indigenous people Wale, Gullah, Gullah, Geechee, Wale, Geechee. If you disagree, hey, I might not know. I only got a half a cent. That's why we put boots on the ground. Doesn't make sense to anybody. So if you're Gullah, Geechee, some say the Gullah, Geechee are African. Some say the uh, Gullah, Geechees that I know, shout out to them. They say they're indigenous to the land of Americas. And we are on the Gullah Geechee land, right? The Wale Geechee land. Again, look, this is the Sherman necktie I told you about. We're gonna see that again. This is what they did. So when the Union came down, Sherman men would pull up the train tracks and tie them around. They heat up the, the metal again, tied around a tree, and they call it the Sherman necktie. You know, that way the um, Confederates couldn't repair it and get the trains going and get the, uh, what they need, their supplies. This is a lot of land, a lot of acreage out here. And where we get into the forts, you know how we do. We got to put in our recon work. So welcome to Fort McAllister. Welcome to Wale Indian Territory. One time for the indigenous people. Give me a hand clap. All right, let's continue to go. Here we go, going up to the fort. This is what the Union Army would have saw had they come aground, which they end up doing. But you can see how it's sitting on mounds, man-made mounds. And like we say, this is Indian indigenous territory. So my question is, some of this stuff was already here, some of these mounds, these earthworks, uh, just a side question. And you can see how they were fortified. So you came running over the hill, not knowing that this was there. See the business you get? You know, they got them all the way, away around, fortified. You know, it was a moat, but not made for water. This is a defense mechanism to slow down your attackers. Right, and you see the cannon looking at you too. Oh, imagine all the smoke and cloud, right? You running, you're trying to get low or get somewhere, the cannon firing, 
and then you don't see where you're going, and then you get Vlad impaled. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Vlad the impaler, you get impaled, right? Um, so we're going to continue to go around, coming through, seeing what was what. Get into the forts. Get into the forts. Remember we did Etowah Mounds? And they had like a, a, something, a defense like this. If you haven't, go watch my video, uh, Etowah Mounds. That's what's mine on the YouTube. You know, um, and you can see. Seemed like an indigenous type of entrenched warfare, the way to stop your enemies. And you had different pockets. See, that goes up and down. So what we got here, this is uh, Captain John McCready, designer of the Fort McAllister. And it says, Charleston, a student of Agassi at Harvard, then the professor of mathematics at the College of Charleston. He designed his position at the outbreak of the war and became an officer in the Confederate engineers. Transferred to Savannah, he spent his efforts surrounding that city with an extensive ring of defense. Savannah, like I say, was so important. We saw the cotton, all the money that was Savannah was uh, uh, getting, <laughs> you know, um, from all the cotton and other uh, exchanges. The rest of his life was academics. He returned to his old profession ship uh, in Charleston, later became assistant to Agassi, then professor of zoology at Harvard, and finally professors of biology and University of the South Shawnee, Tennessee. Right? Okay. Let's see, let's see. Trying to get closest to the water we can. Keep off the mounds, they say. Get close to this gun, this cannon. Uh, from what I'm understanding about it, we're going to walk. Fort McAllister. We're going to get deeper into some history. Um, um, how this fort held up. This fort held up against the Union, even against the ironclad ships and the firepower. And this gun here, get a view of the Ogeechee River and what the gun would have saw. Again, Ogeechee River, shout out to the Wale. So this gun here, as I understand it, is what they call a hot shot. And what they would do is set something on fire and send it and fire it from this cannon, right? Out there towards the ships. Now this didn't work against ironclad ships so it would have to be only fired against wooden ships, you know, like we did in Pirates and Privateers when they went to war. They would throw like little grenades that were bursting the fires and flames and burnt the deck up. Same idea. Right. All right let's go get some more. Let's go get some more. Fort McAllister. Let's go get to the nitty gritty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hashtag BOTG with back. I appreciate y'all rocking out with me, you know? Thank you for your time. That's looking at the cannon that we saw. And your enemy will be coming in that way. And that cannon will be there waiting on them, right? And they got the uh, impalers, I'm gonna call them, <laughs> all the way around. You know, built for defense, right? So you got that all the way around. We on top of the mounds, you can see these. Some of these mounds are pretty high, right? They may would have been higher back then. You know, it's been raining, bad flooding around here. So, but you know, boots on the ground. We got to go get this work. You know what I'm saying? We got to continue to build and get the true history. See what's what happened, put the tangibles to the story, right? I'm up on top of the mound, it got levels, you know? We go check them out, get some more literature.
Try to take you to the top of the mountain, baby. Fort McAllister. And you can see it's, it's earth and mounds. So even though the Union had more technology, remember they took down Fort Pulaski in 30 hours. Fort Pulaski was built of masonry, bricks, and the Union, they had superior firepower. Um, the shells that they was uh, shooting would spin. So it blasted that brick down and uh, 30 hours it was it was tucking down and we also know that Fort Jackson was tucking down pretty quickly not this one not this one because even though they had uh union had superior firepower this is earth so it just go in you know hard to damage and we'll get a little more to that story on why this place stood up longer than the other two and once this one fell that's when Savannah was um, invaded, you know? That's when Sherman came to Savannah and uh, we'll get the story on that. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Hashtag BOTG with back. That's a mile. Yeah. While a Indian territory. Yeah. Now this is um Captain Nicholas Clitch. When called upon by the Union officers to surrender during Sherman's assault, December 13, 1864, Clitch responded with a blow of his sword. After three sabers, six bayonets, and two gunshots, wounds he was taking he ain't going out without a fight <laughs> basically that's what he's did you see that after three sabers six bayonets and two gunshot wounds he was taken wow called sleeping with your boots on dying with your boots on let's see what else we got here let's get up on this big mile Let's get up on the big mound. Yeah, this is definitely Indian territory. If this was Wale territory, Wale Indians territory, some of these mounds had to be already here because that's part of the mound bender, builders, right? Mississippi and culture, right? But uh, well, when you read the story, it was saying that um, McAllister Jr., I think he was a junior, had this built, and it was saying by his so-called um, Negro uh, soldiers that he had, and he said they can build it in six days. I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one. Civil War, we talking 1861 to 65, 64, not too far long ago. My thing is, where the Wale Indians? Well, huh? Don't tell me they all extinct. That story is out of here. We out here to find truth over facts. Let's see what this mound talking about. Tom Cat. Garrison Muskrat. A mascot. The sole Confederate fatality after seven hours of intensive bombardment on March 3rd, 1863 by the monitor passing captain previous Drayton. Oh, wow. Drayton. That's one of my surnames coming out of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, anyway, <laughs> side note, Naha and Patasco supported by the Montauk. Okay, the Montauk is the ship, the Union ship. Um, the West Canal and the Seneca, the Don, the Flambeau, and the Sebago. I know I'm saying a lot of this wrong. The Captain Williams, uh, the Norfolk Packet, and the Para was the garrison's mascot. The death of the cat was deeply regretted by the men, and news of the fatality was communicated to General Brigadier in the official report 
of the action. So they must really love that cat because they put it in the official report. Okay. Hmm. What's missing out of the report? <laughs> Let's go. More of the Geechee River. This is where the, the naval battle, you know, the Civil War is mostly uh, land. But, and down here was land and naval. So this is what the Ogeechee River. Um, and this is what it says. I don't know if y'all can see that. It says, damage from naval, naval bombardment. The largest Navy guns used against land fortifications were fired on Fort McAllister in 1863 from monitor type Union ironclads. 15 inch shells penetrated 17 feet of sand, digging craters eight feet in diameter and seven feet deep on exploding. But all damage could be repaired overnight. See, this is why this fort was so strong because it didn't have the brick and mortars. It didn't have the um, well, the other forts. So you just, a shell going to the dirt, explode. Nobody's injured. Put some more dirt back in it. Let's check out this here. Shives Rice Mill. From the roof, from the roof of Shives Rice Mill, two and a half miles across the Ogeechee in the direction of the Arrow. So if you could see over there. That was the rice mills, um, plantations or farms where they used to uh, sell the rice. Like I say, it was King Cotton rice, indigo. You had a lot of things, sassafras that were coming out of South Carolina and Georgia. But um, General Sherman and his staff watched the reduction of Fort McAllister's uh, under the sunset, December 13, 1864. Right? So... They watched the destruction. And what really happened is that um, you know, Sherman had 4,000 men, you know, pull up on these seas, 4,000 men. And uh, Fort, Fort McAllister at the time, you know, they son home, the old men and the ones that were married. And they were, only had like 200 or less people, the story goes. So, you know, talking about getting jumped. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 4,000 versus 200. Uh, so... You know, eventually they end up um, they end up surrendering with the white flag. But um, this fort, out of like I say, out of all three of them, lasted the longest. You know, it was the blockade, uh, obstruction of river, the block, the, to block the channel of the Ogeechee River. A double row of piling was placed across the river at the point of the opposite this marker. So, like I say, this was your naval battle. And um, the first encounter, I think it was in 1861, 62, McAllister, uh, Fort McAllister stood his ground against the Union, right? So what they did, we talked about the ship. So you had the Nebraska, I'm believing the name of the ship, the Nebraska tried to come in and sneak supplies in, and then it ran aground, meaning it hit the sand, and it couldn't move, it was stuck. So you had the Montauk, the uh, Union ship came and just blasted it, just 20 minutes, destroyed the whole ship. And then the Union left, um, cause it was at a stalemate. Cause like I said, this is earthen. So both of them were shooting big guns. Speaking of big guns, let's look at this one. So they were shooting at each other but uh, no damage to uh, n none because, uh, like I said, the Union had the ironclad. That was their new technology. They had the ironclad. And McC McAllister had what you see, dirt mounds. You know? That could, like I said, it could be repaired overnight. So, what happened? <laughs> Here we go. Position of the monitor. So the Montauk attacked the ship. Uh, blew it the smithereens they say but they say everybody got off off the Nebraska and make sure I get the right ship though and um, that was uh, the battle and look at these guns 
So Fort McAllister uh, stood her ground long as she could. Wow, look at this gun. Look at this cannon. Bring it in your face. Y'all see that? Heavyweight. You know? Heavyweight. Heavyweight. It's from the Civil War. From the Civil War. What a what a what a gun. Just digging on information. Getting some history. Let's see what it says about it. Columbia. This replica of a coast defense cannon known as the Columbia was manufactured 1964 by Savannah Machinery and found the company as a public service. A similar cannon was positioned here during Union Navy attacks in 1863. The Columbia fired 85 pound shells. Wow. It range was 250, 2,050 yards. So this the replica, but you can ma imagine. You can imagine. So let's continue to walk. Walk and talk, you know? So we're doing Civil War and 40 acres in a mule from the point of view of Savannah. It was so strategic and important. They had to put four ports, I mean four forts, to help defend it. And we're gonna talk about some unsung so-called heroes that was in that fight, right? Let's go, um, the so-called five civilized tribes, right? You had your Cherokee, you had your uh, Muscogee, your Choctaw, Chickasaw, your Seminole participated in this war, you know? Actually, there's not a war on American soil that indigenous people, a.k.a. Indians, didn't participate in. And still to, to this day, they're in the military. Message. Now take that mountain and bust it down. But we don't see a lot of people when they uh, take these pictures or put them in books. Uh, I think that's a shame. But... um. That's why we got to do boots on the ground, get the story ourselves, And that's why genealogy is important too. You can see your people that fought in these wars and you will know where they're from, right? Not just the whole, everybody in the soup can and everybody the same. Nah, you can't win a battle with just one. Yeah, you need a lot of people. <laughs> but anyway, let's go and get some more. Let's go and see. It's a rifle magazine, huh? Mm, short up in here. So this is under the mound, family. This is under the mound. And uh, this is where they kept the magazines. So your gunpowder and everything. I got to bend down a little bit in here. You know? So... The eight inch Columbia, we saw that out there. Let's see if they got something in here. Now. So let's walk back out and see whatever, what other thing we can walk under. It's said to be um Let me see if I can find the mound. It's not really a big, big place, but it's just a bunch of mounds. Like I say, shout out to the Wale Indians. No, um, this is definitely that territory. Oh, that's the one, the eight inch, where I think they had converted into a hospital. And um, another thing about the story, when um, Sherman them finally won, you know, like I said, it was four thousand men they say uh, against two hundred. And um, so Sherman them finally won and came. Sherman was, like we just read, Sherman was overwatching uh, the destruction of uh, Fort McAllister that we're here now. And he came up, he came on land, they had dinner, and he was mad because what the, the Southerners did, the Confederates, they plant landmines all in the ground, right? They plant landmines. So you walk on them, one step, kaboom. You know what I'm saying? Like Biggie said, Big Papa, shout out. 
You feel me? So he was so upset about that. He said, you know what? He said, y'all Confederates, y'all gonna dig them all out by hand. Next morning, y'all gonna dig them all out by hand. And they did it. And uh, they tried to bring Sherman up on, I guess, war crimes. And Sherman defended himself and said, I was looking out for the safety of my men. We are on this land and uh, we walk on there and, and they kill us. So, you know, that's that's what that uh, incident was with uh, Sherman. Let me see. Let me see. I think we really got the mounds. And like I say, shout out to the Wale Indians. Shout out to the Wale Ogeechee. The Wale Geechee Indians. Cause we saw the river is Geechee. This is Wale and you look at the spelling. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I only got a half a cent of information. Just something to think about. Cause people be heavy with the pin game on his story. So what we do? Take the mountain, bust it down to a pebble. Right. Hashtag BOTG with back. We put boots on the ground, baby. I want to see really what's going on. I need truth over facts. Yeah, give me the truth over the facts. So that's what happened. Yep. After Fort McAllister fell, Sherman said, Fort McAllister fell. He said, Savannah is mine. He started moving with the pen work. That's your great emancipation, they say. Abraham Lincoln, right? So it's something I wanna show y'all. See this here. First, I didn't know what was going on in here. <laughs> see this? It says that you see it for yourself. The Anaconda <laughs> plan. So I said, what is the Anaconda plan? Uh, so I just had to keep following. Like Rock Kim say, follow the leader. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this was the Anaconda plan. This is how they was gonna get back the Union. See right here? Everybody that was involved. Right, so they coming down to Virginia's. Hitting the Carolinas. Coming on the water and land. There's a naval and a ground force attack. Coming around Florida. They done got Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. See the ships? There's a land and ground assault that the Union planned. And coming around and embodied everybody that said they was uh, succeeding. The Anaconda plan. And Sherman felt that Charleston and South Carolina, since they started it, uh, was going to get it the worst. And uh, he did bomb, bomb that place. Uh, like I say, Savannah got burned by the locals because they didn't want the Union to get it, but not nothing heavy. But uh, that's your Anaconda plan. You can see the stripes and bars. There you go. That's it. The Anaconda plan. I thought that was, I want to show y'all that. You know? So, here it is. East Gulf. West Gulf. Bring the Union, bring the South back into the Union. What it was all about. That was the goal, the number one goal, no matter what you've heard. <laughs> so the South had fought and um, you know, the King Cotton, what I was telling you about, the reason I see. And they also got this other book called uh, this is The Hidden Reasons for the um, Civil War or I'm just show you the book. <laughs> I'm gonna show you what I got. King Cotton. You can see the numbers. You can get to it. We put tangibles to the story. 
Yeah, so can't cotton. You holding it down, my man? You good? Oh, he got the blue on. He's a Union soldier. Yeah, y'all. King Cotton, right there. This is the porch right here. This is the porch right here. This was, the succession was about, because they said the North wanted to put an extra tax on them. They didn't put another tax and another tax. The South said, we got doing that. No, sir! So, South Carolina succeeded, and then the other states followed. Um, the other states said, uh, if South Carolina succeeds, we will back them up. And that's how you get your succession, where everybody started leaving the union. So when you look at it, when I look at it, slavery, I don't know. I don't see it really being that was the case. Uh, that we can talk about who these slave masters were and what they looked like, their complexion, and who these slaves were, right? So-called, were they family members? Huh? Think about it. Genealogy. But um, it's the, uh, the ship, the Montauk, that's the uh, Union ironclad ship that destroyed this ship. I tell you that ran aground to Nashville uh, with the supplies and uh, the Montauk took her out. Took her out. I'm gonna show you some pieces from that ship that they still have around here. Um, yeah, so that's what's coming out. The cannons, the torpedoes, so this is a uh, ironclad USS Montauk. That would have been Union. And this is how they took, and that's a, look at that ball. All right, let's get to the next, the next. And that's a Confederate wood float and anchor torpedo. Pretty big. I guess the, uh, it was floating in the water a shipper hit that button on top and kaboom, everything goes dark in the room, you know? Let's continue to go. What's up, Abe? What's the truth, Abe? <laughs> Hashtag BOTG, we're back. We gonna find out, 100. Like I said, um, this was the Nashville, the CSS, you know, was running the blockade. It, um, Got caught by the Montauk, like we talked about, that's a February 28th, 1863. And uh, at the Ogeechee River and the Montauk blew it out the water. Um, and I just want to show you some of the parts of the ship uh, that they took out. Hopefully y'all can see just some of the pieces that were left from the ship. Say so war is an ugly thing, right? What is it good for? Yeah. So there's some of the pieces. You know, we on the way out, headed to the next spots. Boots on the ground, putting tires to the pavement. Civil War, 40 acres of the mule. From the Savannah, Georgia point of view. And, uh... Presented by me, myself, back for what's mine, you know, on things I think that we should look at or uh, add to the story. And watch, like, share, subscribe, and leave in the comment if something I left out from this area, though. You know, um, yeah, this was the Nashville trying to bring in supplies. Montauk Union ship caught up. Blew him out the water. This is war. Mm
doing now? Cause we doing the Civil War and 40 acres in the mule. This area right here is very important. This is Ebenezer Creek area. Yeah, you know the one that General Davis, when they freed the so-called slaves, they made a pontoon. Now it's all forced up and it goes a little further back. It's just some private property, but I'm taking you to the area. So the story goes, once they got freed, once General Brigadier General Davis freed the slaves, it was 5,000 of them, they say. And they couldn't cross the Ebenezer Creek. The creek is said to be 165 feet wide, 10 feet deep. Right? So what happened? They freed them. So General Davis had 14,000 men of soldiers, cannons, and everything. So what they made, they made pontoons. They made pontoons to cross the bridge, to cross the creek. And then he told the so-called free slaves not to cross until all the men and equipment get crossed. But soon as he did that, soon as all the men and everybody got crossed, he gave orders to pull the pontoons. So the so-called slaves were stuck with the Confederate soldiers right behind them. So they got a lot of killed, got killed, a lot of got a lot of people drowned, men, women, and children, old men they say. Ebenezer Creek. This area over here. So that's part of the story that we, we're gonna start with. I want to bring y'all and show y'all. Y'all know me, BOTG. We're back. I get the tangibles. Right? So that's gonna lead up to something else. And I'm gonna take you where I'm gonna tell you what's this the prelude to all the people that died. Colonel Kerr. 20 years ago uh, after the current said he saw it and, and it hurt his eyes he never want to see that again something like that all those people got murdered and the union was supposed to come down and help free the slaves and take care of them but they didn't so Brigadier Davis gave the orders to pull the pontoons and a lot of people died at Ebenezer Creek you know back I bring the tangibles so we're going to continue to go on and fill this all in. Back at it, back at it. Civil War trails in Georgia. Now, you're going to walk with me for a minute. You know what I'm saying? Still starting with Ebenezer. So important. Right? I found another route to show more of the water. It's the boat ramp show more of how wide and deep this this creek is you know like i say this is important this part of it because it's a prelude to something that you know i'm going to lead you to and so right now we out here hashtag botg with back boots on the ground you know we put the tangibles to the story Right? Some more Ebenezer Creek. It's already swampy right here. The puddles. So let's get to it. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Wow, this is a real low tide. Back bring you the tangibles. Ebenezer Creek standing on the bank you got no help in front of you with the Union Army and you got slave catchers and killers at the back so you jump in the water I hope for the best like I said it was women little children and old men a lot of them drown this is another part with that said, let's blow some smoke. Blow some smoke for the 
ancestors. Never know who's who. Might be yours. So we do the genealogy. Pull out some libation. Right? Respect. Ebenezer Creek. Look at this tree. Tree can tell a story. Wow. Look at the trunk. It's a different type of tree. Ebenezer Creek, y'all. Low tide. Remember, 1884, December 9th. Kind of cold. So you know the water was cold. Ain't no telling what type of animals were in that water. Right? We do have alligators here. Snakes, this is the woods. Shout out to the indigenous, the Indian population. A lot of those people they would tell you was coming from foreign lands. Maybe had some black Europeans in there and some indigenous roots to the Americas. So let's go get some more work. Hashtag BOTG with back.